Well, last spring, I drove up to Minneapolis to bring one of my sons home after a year of studying at the University of Minnesota. And I made that trip a bunch of times, and um, it's a pretty straightforward trip. You drive from here to the Twin Cities. You just head your car north in 94. Six hours later, you get there. It's a pretty easy trip, even though it does take about six hours. So I got up there just fine, spent the day helping him pack up all his stuff, and the next morning, we left for home. But just to be sure, I got back to I-94 heading the right direction, from the university, I took out my smartphone, and I actually just got a text from my wife. No, took out my smartphone, turned on my GPS. <laughs> I think she knows I'm in the service right now. Um, <laughs> took out my GPS, and um, just to make sure I got to the highway. And so I fo- started following uh, its directions. And just as we got, it's just only about a half a mile out of the, uh, off campus to get to the highway, but just as we got there, there was a sign up, a detour sign. It said, ramp closed. I thought, no problem. I'll just keep following GPS, my GPS, and it'll get, me, it'll get me to the next best place to get on the highway. You know, I had faith. So the lady inside my phone uh, told me to turn here, turn there, stay straight here. And then after about 10 minutes or so, I realized we were right back at the exact same place with the exact same ramp close sign. So I thought, okay, I'll just, I'll just close the app, start the app up again. So we're driving, you know, I can't stop anywhere. And, and then she'll get it right next time. And so, sure enough, she started talking again. We went all the way around, all the way around, and came back. And for the third time, we're back at the same exact ramp again. And then I realized that the lady inside my uh, GPS, my phone, doesn't know about construction in Minneapolis. She keeps trying to get me back to the same exact place. So it ended up taking me an hour to get just outside of Minneapolis, all because of that. Now, the moral of that story is, is it's possible, or I discovered, again, it's possible to be driving 60 miles an hour and actually going nowhere. It's also possible to be very sincere in your belief that you're on the right road and the whole time being on the wrong road. We're in a series right now from the Sermon on the Mount called The Way of Blessing. And for seven weeks, we've been looking at what Jesus has to say about teaching us what the kingdom of God looks like in everyday life. And it's, it's a way of living out eternal truth in everyday living that makes a difference in the world. And we, so far we've seen that it looks like the way of influence. Influence for good and for grace and for love, like salt and light in the world. It looks like generosity. It looks like purity, especially in our relationships. It looks like prayer. Last week, Jeff, uh, in a very timely and difficult teaching, said it looks like turning the other cheek. It looks like going the extra mile. It looks like a refusal to, to respond to injustice with retaliation and revenge. Appropriate for our world today. Today we're going to see it looks like the way of salvation. We're in Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Just two verses. Extraordinary teaching Jesus gives us here. So let me read these verses to you. You, look on, you can look on the screen. Jesus says, Enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Jesus starts off by talking about two roads. Two roads. And I want to begin by talking about two men. Two men who share the same first name, but who are separated by about a half a century and about a million cultural miles. Okay, Both of them share the first name Robert. The first man is Robert Frost. Robert Frost, in 1920, wrote a poem entitled, The Road Not Taken. It begins like this. Two roads diverged. How many can finish the line? In a yellow wood. How many memorized that back in English class? Anybody? Remember reading that poem? Anybody? Two roads diverged in a yellow wood. It ends like this. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. The second Robert is Robert Plant of the well-known iconic rock band Led Zeppelin. Uh, arguably, arguably, Robert Plant's most famous song was, anyone? You're going to give yourself away, but yeah, Stairway to Heaven. Okay, in which we find this line. Yes, there are two paths you can go by, but in the long run, anyone? There's still time to change the road you're on. Both Roberts talk about two roads, and both acknowledge that the road you choose makes all the difference, but I don't think either man I don't think either man knew that he was quoting and talking about the same thing Jesus was talking about. Jesus also talks about two roads. He says, enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, 
and many enter through it. That's the first road. Now, what's he talking about? He's using a, an everyday illustration, which he often did, to explain a very significant spiritual truth. Just as in his day, we today, all of us, know what a, know what a wide road is. We can think of a six-lane highway. Uh, we can th- know what a narrow road is. We can think of a little country single-lane road or maybe a bike path type road. We, but that makes sense to us. We know what a wide road is, what a narrow road is. So they did in Jesus' day as well. Now, he's making a spiritual point here. The wide road is what might be called, and I like to play around with this, calling it the Burger King Road. This is the have it your way road. It's what might be called designer spirituality. Do-it-yourself religion. I knew someone one time who said, uh, I'm a spiritual man, I'm just not a religious man. That was his excuse for not being part of any organized church. There are a whole lot of people in our culture who believe this, who work this way. In fact, I think this is the default mode road of many, many people in our culture. Because this is the easiest road to find. It's the easiest road to travel. It's the road that allows you to travel whatever speed you want to go, whatever direction you want to go. No speed limits, no traffic lights, no yield signs. It's the road where you get to decide what God is like. It's the road where you get to decide what God cares about. It's the road where you get to decide what the rules are. It's the road where there is no such thing as sin, hopelessly old-fashioned word in our culture. There are just infinite choices. You might remember way back in Genesis, where the whole story starts, God places a limit right at the center of human experience. You can have everything in the garden. It's all there for your pleasure, except do not eat from that tree. If you eat from that tree, you will surely die. He placed a limit in the middle of the garden so that human beings would forever know that he is God and they are not. And Satan, right from the beginning, challenges that limit. And Satan still challenges that limit. He still draws people to what I would call the wide road, what Jesus calls the wide road. Let me give you a few examples of the wide road. This road says things like, all roads lead to God. Every religion, every approach to spirituality, if it's sincere, leads to the same place. It's probably the most common thing expressed in our culture today. This road says, you're a pretty good person. You're above average. Most of you are, I can tell just by looking. You've done more good than bad in your life, therefore, that's enough. Any God we can imagine, certainly, that would be enough for that God to be doing more good than bad. Or it says, my God would never judge anyone. What kind of God judges people? The problem with the wide road, Jesus says, is that it leads to a spiritual dead end. It leads to a spiritual dead end. It's following your GPS, but going in circles. It's following your GPS, but winding up at the same exit that's closed. You're sincere, but you're going 60 miles an hour, but Jesus said it leads to destruction. But there is a second road, he says. This road he calls the narrow road. Let me read the passage again. Enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. Many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life. And only a few find it. Now, what's he mean by that? Way back in the early 80s, my wife and I, right after we were married, uh, lived for six months in Santa Cruz, Bolivia, on a short-term mission experience. And Bolivia is an amazing country. Haven't been there in many years, but it's small. It's landlocked. But it's just spectacular in its physical beauty. From mountains to lakes to uh, high desert plains, it's just spectacular. But the roads, when we were there... Uh, weren't really all that good in the interior of the country because it's a very poor country. In particular, it was the road between Santa Cruz and Cochabamba, which we had to drive twice while I was in Bolivia. It took about 10 hours to travel this road, um, only about 150 miles or so, maybe not even that far. But as you can see, um, it's, a, it's a winding, narrow mountain road and many places just wide enough for one vehicle. Bolivian drivers have a way of actually passing on those roads, which is just a hair-raising experience to go through it. But that's always what I think of that road when I read this passage. Now, what does Jesus mean by the narrow road? He doesn't necessarily mean a dangerous road, but he does mean a difficult road. And it's difficult because it's a road defined by truth, and we don't like truth very much. We don't like narrow roads because we don't like roads where we don't get to make all the rules. We don't like roads where we get to drive any speed we want, go any direction we want, where you never have to yield. We don't like roads like that. It's a road, 
he says, that's narrow because it's defined by someone else. Here's how Jesus defines that road in John chapter 14, a different book in the New Testament. Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, here Jesus says, in essence, in clearest possible language, that he himself is the narrow road. Now, I want you to hold that thought. Some of you here tonight might actually uh, be objecting to that claim in your mind right now. And it's okay. Hold that thought. We're going to come back to it in just a minute. So he starts with two roads. Secondly, Jesus talks about the exclusivity of truth. The exclusivity of truth. Begin in kind of an unusual place. I would guess that most of you know that the Chicago Cubs played the uh, Chicago White Sox this past week in four games called the Crosstown Series. Now, how many of you are Cubs fans here? Would you call yourselves Cubs fans? Okay, wonderful. How many Sox fans? A few. Okay, thank you. Now, being a fan is a matter of personal preference, right? Just nod your heads. Personal preference, right? There's nothing right or wrong about a personal preference. Unless you're a Cardinal fan, right? No, I'm just kidding about that. <laughs> it's like preferring thin crust or deep dish. That's not a moral issue. It's just a preference issue. You know, it's like vanilla or chocolate. But truth is something different. Let's say if I say I'm a Cubs fan, I've made a statement of preference, we all get it. You say, okay, you're a Cubs fan, Pastor Brian. Fine, I'm a, I'm a Sox fan. But if I say this, the Cubs won the World Series last year. I'm making a different kind of statement. That's not a preference statement. That's a truth statement, right? The Cubs won the World Series last year. I'm making a truth claim, and I would be wrong. Why? Because the Cubs did not win the World Series last year, nor any of the previous 108 years before that. They didn't win the World Series, right? Now, when it comes to spiritual truth, to God, to salvation, to eternal life after death, we have this tendency to confuse personal preference with truth. Let me try to explain. Two things we need to know about truth. And here I'm going to ask you to, to think with me a little bit. Uh, I believe every sermon should require you to think or learn something, help you feel something, and then decide to do something. Now, all of our sermons don't hit all three targets, but right now I'm going to ask you to, to think. So think with me. As human beings, we know this about truth. We know that all truth is exclusive. We know this, but we fight against it. We know, for example, that at the end of a baseball game between the Cubs and White Sox, the score will tell us which team won. One team wins, the other team loses. For example, the Cubs won the last game of the Crosstown Series 3-1. to one. We may not like the outcome, and that may not be our preference, but we can't dispute the outcome because it's true. The Cubs won 3-1. to one. By the way, they lost today 4-1 to one to another team. Furthermore, if someone asks us, who won the last game of the Cubs Sox series, we would never, ever say, well, amazingly, both teams won. The Cubs won and the Sox won. Everyone went home happy. It was awesome. Because it doesn't work that way, does it? Because two things that contradict each other cannot both be true in the same way at the same time. We know this instinctively because truth is exclusive. This holds fast in almost every area of our lives. For example, money. Let's say I have $100 in my bank account at the bank. The bank says I have $100 in my savings account. I say I have a million. Both those tru truths can't be true at the same time. Both those claims can't be true at the same time, right? They can't be. We know that. So we don't try to argue the bank into giving me a million dollars. We know that's crazy. Gravity. I can't choose to trust gravity when I drive my car, trusting, to stay, trusting it to keep me on the road as I go around the curve, and then simultaneously disregard it and choose to jump off the roof of my house. I can't choose when gravity is true. It just is true. The problem comes when we consider spiritual truth, the most important truth we ever consider. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And when he says that, he's making a truth statement. And that truth is exclusive. It's exceedingly clear. If Jesus is the way, there is no other way. If Jesus is the way, then all roads cannot and do not lead to the same place, to the same God. If Jesus is the way, we do not get to create our own spiritual truth. Now, and here's the issue. 
as human beings, that's exactly what we would prefer to do. We want to make the rules. Ever since Genesis chapter 1, we want to make the rules. We want to determine our own spiritual truth. Something in us rebels when Jesus says, I am the way. What do you mean, you are the way? What do you mean, Jesus is the way? How can you be so exclusive? How can you think your truth is any more true than my truth? My truth says that Jesus is only one of many ways to reach God. And that sounds like a pretty good argument to our culturally conditioned ears and minds. But did you know that every major world religion makes claims that are exclusive? Every one. For example, let me just give you a couple of examples. Islam claims that to please Allah enough to enter paradise, you have to do five things called the five pillars of Islam. You have to proclaim there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his prophet. You have to pray five times a day facing Mecca. You have to give alms to the poor. You have to fast during the month of Ramadan. And you have to make a hajj once in your life. That's a pilgrimage to Mecca. And by the way, if you have the bonus of you die in a holy war and a jihad, you pass straight through go and you go straight to um, paradise. All, that's, you do all that and you might do enough to please Allah, but there's no guarantee. By the way, the Quran teaches that Jesus is not the Son of God, that Jesus did not die on the cross and he did not raise again from the dead. Let's go to uh, Hinduism. In Hinduism, the concept of salvation is a very, very difficult to define, but it has to do with the idea of karma. That is, doing more good in your life in this time around so that next time as you're reincarnated, you get a little higher level so that you eventually escape the cycle of rebirth until you uh, uh, achieve completeness. And by the way, Hinduism teaches there's not one God, but 330 million gods. Clearly, all these claims cannot be true at the same time in the same way because truth is exclusive, right? Now, not only is truth exclusive, but all roads have a destination. Now, if you're still with me at all, you're thinking, well, duh. All roads do have a destination. That's not news. If I drive north on Randall Road, I get to Elgin, right? If I go west on, uh, on Kesslinger, I will get to Elburn right? Here's the point. I can't go north on Randall Road and expect to get to Elburn. We all know that. Yet I would submit that's exactly what many, many people in our culture do when it comes to the spiritual dimension of our lives. Andy Stanley calls this the principle of the path. Here's a nice little book where he says, every path has a destination, and that path always leads to that destination. And every step we take along that path gets us closer to that one and only destination for that path. The problem is we like to pretend that the principle of the path does not apply to us. We like to pretend that we're an exception. We like to pretend that I and I alone can go north and around the road and wind up in Elburn because I really want to. That's what we want to believe. Let me illustrate. Let's say there's a student. College student goes off to college, enjoys the newfound freedoms of college life just a little too much, skips class a little too often, ignores his reading assignments, forgets to get his term paper in, and expects to get an A at the end of the semester. So that student, he or she, is on the path called flunking out. But he or she believes she's on the path called dean's list. Right? You see what I'm talking about? Our finances, for example. We buy all kinds of things on credit, believing, as our culture teaches us, that so long as we manage our monthly payments, we're fine. And we're surprised one day to find ourselves in a deep hole of debt. See, we want to be on the path marked financial security and prosperity. We are actually on the path called bankruptcy. But we pretend that we're not. And when it comes to spiritual truth, we pick and choose what to believe that is, we assert our right to decide what's true for us. What could be more American than saying, this is true for me. This is my truth. Deal with it. So we create our, one, our own little one-person religion. And many, many people just disregard Jesus' words as being hopelessly old-fashioned, narrow-minded. And we find ourselves on the road marked spiritual enlightenment. That Jesus says is actually the pathway toward destruction. He says, in Proverbs 16, 25, the Bible says, there is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end, it leads to death. Now, it sounds like so far, this is all bad news. We're all driving around lost. What's the good news? There is good news. The good news is the inclusiveness of the gospel. That's where we wind up tonight, the inclusiveness of the gospel. A few months after we were married, 
I told you we went to uh, Bolivia, South America on a short-term mission experience. Very, very rich experience in so many ways. But after six months, we were, we were ready to come home. So we packed up all our stuff, made all the arrangements to fly home. Now, you need to know uh, that in Bolivia at that time, travel was just <laughs> a nerve-wracking experience. I don't know how it is now, but it was nerve-wracking then. Because uh, in Bolivia at the time, the economy was very, very poor. Inflation was like 10,000%. And so there were regular national strikes of all kinds of workers. So if a certain set of workers went on strike, without any notice, that part of the country would just shut down. And sometimes it was airports, and sometimes it was taxis, and sometimes it was something else, police officers. And it was, everybody was going on strike because nobody was getting paid. Sometimes, also, the, the power would go out in whole cities, whole regions of cities. And when that happened, the airport would also shut down. So even though we had tickets, we never knew exactly when your flight's going to go. So it was nerve-wracking. Plus, the, the infrastructure was of, of the time was you had, to, you had your ticket, but you had to get that ticket sort of validated by two or three different low-level officials. Then you had to take your passport, get that validated. You had to get your visa, get, you had to get that validated. It took like six or seven stops, all different places around the city. And each time you stopped in one of these little offices, you had to pay a few extra pesos. That's how the system worked. It, they were like tips. They were, they were really sort of, we would call them bribes. They were just tips. That's how the culture worked. So we did all that, had all our stuff, had all our tickets, had everything packed up, got the airport, flight's going to leave. So we were relieved. Our bags checked. We went up the last stairway to the gate we were going to leave, ready to go home. And there was one more guy standing at the top of the stairway wearing a uniform. He looked like he was an official. As I got to the top of the stairway, leading uh, my wife and uh, my, actually my brother and his family were behind me, uh, he said, Passaporte. So he was checking my passport, and I had, we, we had every stamp. We had like set 12 stamps, and I was, I was confident. Gave him my passport. He took my passport, and he looked at me. He looked back at my passport, and he said, uh, Su pasaporte no es valido. Your passport no, is not valid. And then I looked back at him, and I said in perfect Spanish, What do you mean my passport no es valido? That's exactly how I said it, too. <laughs> what do you mean? And I pointed to the stamp and the signature of my passport. Look, I paid for that. This guy stamped my passport. He shook his head sadly and said in Spanish, that man doesn't work there anymore. I said, what? He said, he doesn't work there anymore. Su pasaporte no es valido. And then it hit me. He wanted one more tip. One more little bitty bribe of just a few pesos. And something inside me snapped like a dry twig. <laughs> I was not going to pay another peso. I was not going to. I was going to get on that plane and go home. So I took my passport. This is one of the proudest things of my life. I took my passport, thinking on my feet, and I opened it up to the first page. Where on the first page of your passport, there's the great American seal, and there's a signature of the President of the United States, right? At that time, it was Ronald Reagan. I opened it up, and I said, I said look here, look. And I'm, I'm, I'm talking English really fast because I don't know what I'm, I, I was part, some, maybe some Spanish words. And I said, look here, look here, President Ronald Reagan, El Presidente Ronaldo Reagano, me amigo. <laughs> and he still works there. We're getting on the plane. And this guy looked at me. He got this little smile on his face like, okay, you got me. And he just waved us through. <laughs> and here's the moral of that story. Sometimes it's not who you are that matters. It's who you know that matters. And this is the gospel. Jesus says, I am the way I am the gate. What he means is our salvation, our eternal destiny, is not dependent on our actions, our religious behaviors. Salvation cannot be earned or deserved. Rather, it can only be received by faith in who he is and what he has done. Now, let me stop there for just a second. I want to acknowledge that it's possible that for some of you here today, that sounds just odd and off and crazy. The gospel always will sound a little crazy to some. You're thinking, you expect me to believe, Pastor Brian, that God came to earth in a man, and that that guy died, but then really didn't die, came back to life, and you expect, you expect me to believe that. And that my entire faith should be on that guy. I'm saying, uh-huh, that's what I'm saying. And here's why. In Genesis chapter 1, the first verse, it says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Today, the, the most brilliant scientists and astrophysicists have proven to us that the entire universe had a beginning. Genesis 1-1 tells us who began it. 
Then in the New Testament, it tells us that in, the, that in the first century, there was a man crucified, dead, and buried. On the third day, he rose again from the dead, and that tomb was empty. And that took place in front of thousands and thousands of people in real time, in real space, in real history, and no one has been able to find that body because there is no body. Put that story, that's the arc of the story. It starts in Genesis 1-1, it ends with an empty tomb. Both, all that happened in real time and space. So nobody made this story up. It's in real time and space and history. Therefore, the gospel is a truth claim and not a preference claim. Jesus is either telling us the truth, listen, he's either telling us the truth or he's lying through his teeth. You have to decide. There is no other option. But notice, the narrow gate, he says, is always open. In John chapter 10, Jesus says it this way, Therefore, Jesus said again, I tell you the truth, I am the gate for the sheep. All who ever came before me were thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. Notice, first there's a truth claim. I am the gate. And that truth is exclusive. All others were thieves and robbers, did not have your, your best interest at heart. They were liars. And then he makes the astonishing statement we can almost miss. I am the gate, and then whoever enters through me will be saved. It's an astonishing word. Whoever. Not the religious, not the really, really good among you, the above average, not the theologically astute, not the politically conservative. Whoever. That tells us it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what you have done. It doesn't matter how long you've avoided, ridiculed, or hated organized religion. It doesn't matter how much you've made fun of the truth of the gospel. None of that disqualifies you. Because the narrow gate is open. You're welcome. All you have to do is surrender to the truth that Jesus, and only Jesus, is the gate to that road. And that narrow road leads to life. Life with a capital L. Some time ago, and many of you have seen these, these, these History Channel things as well, I saw a History Channel special on the Titanic. You know the basic outline of the story. Maybe you've even seen the movie. But at 11.40 p.m. on the night of April 14, 1912, the greatest ship the world has ever seen struck an iceberg in the North Atlantic. The ship that many believe to be unsinkable did exactly that in two hours and 40 minutes and took the lives of over 1,500 men, women, and children, and I found that out this week doing some research, and seven dogs. Two dogs survived. Two out of nine dogs on the, on the Titanic survived. Of the dozens of fascinating and tragic side stories, one always gets my attention every time I hear the story or read about it. The Titanic, as many of you know, only had enough lifeboats for about half of its passengers. There were lots of reasons why that was true. But even more tragic than that, most of those lifeboats were launched that night about half full or less. The enduring question of the Titanic, one of them is, why weren't all the lifeboat seats filled? And there's, again, several answers. First, because it was very chaotic. Uh, the crew did a very um, poor job managing the evacuation. Secondly, it was the middle of the night. Many passengers had already gone to bed. They were confused, disoriented. They were late getting to the deck. But there's one more reason the scholars and historians tell us. And that is, for a long while, Many people on board simply didn't believe Captain John Smith when he told them to abandon ship. They simply could not bring themselves to believe that the great ship would ever sink, and they didn't get in the boats. Question, was Captain Smith telling the truth? Mm -hmm. Was that truth exclusive? Mm -hmm. The ship was either going down or it wasn't. Was the captain being judgmental, narrow-minded, or arrogant in his announcement? Of course not. In fact, I would argue he was being exceedingly gracious, offering the passengers not only the right, not only the truth of the Titanic, but also the way of salvation, the way of life. And he himself never got in a boat to leave space for someone else. So it is with the gospel. Jesus says, I am the way. 
I am the eternal God who created all things, Genesis 1.1. I am the Son of God who took on flesh, died on a Roman cross, rose again from the dead three days later to defeat sin and death. I'm not asking you to be ultra-religious, he says. I'm not asking you to be a theologian or a philosopher. I'm asking you to trust me as the truth. Just trust me and follow me. In a weird way, I think Robert Plant had it right. Yes, there are two paths you can go on. But there's still time to change the one you're on. Let me bow with me as I close. Lord Jesus, thank you for your word today. Thank you for your exceedingly clear claim of truth. In our world is still with so many voices, so many opinions, so many roads that seem so inviting and so smart and so promising, but that really lead nowhere. And I know it's possible someone here tonight is really wrestling with all this stuff, wrestling with truth, wrestling with faith, wrestling with your claims, trying to bring it all together so it makes sense. I pray you'd use these words tonight to help them wrestle through your claim of truth and to surrender to your invitation. For others of us who believe this for a long time, help us to be more certain and more clear on how we can explain it, how we can stand, and how we can help others understand. Thank you for the clarity of your voice, the graciousness of your invitation, and may we trust you and follow you. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.